from The Advocate magazine in partnership with GLAAD, this is LGBTQ and A. I'm Jeffrey Masters, and I would love to be able to put into words what the Indigo Girls mean to me and why their music hits me in such a deep place. But the truth is, I can't. I don't have fancy words to say about their harmonies or lyrics about their extreme storytelling ability that they have exuded for almost four decades. Because I'm not a music writer, right? I'm just a gay millennial with a podcast. But I do know that more than any other band, it is their music that I keep returning to again and again and again. I have a nine-hour drive ahead of me this weekend, where I'm finally returning to Brooklyn. And I smiled when I realized that, oh my god, I'm going to have the privilege of listening to the entire Swamp Ophelia album from start to finish. And there are so many more. Amy Ray and Emily Saliers of the Indigo Girls have paved the way for so many of the queer musicians that we know and love today, and getting to speak to Amy Ray was a real gift. Without further ado, here's Amy. I want to jump right in. You met your bandmate, Emily Saliers, in elementary school. You became friends in high school and eventually formed the Indigo Girls, as I think everyone knows. <laughs> <laughs> so you've known Emily more or less your entire life. But one of the things I've always wondered is at what point in all that did you come out to each other? Oh, yeah. <laughs> God, I feel like it was unspoken at first. I was in love with a girl in high school my senior year, and she was off at Tulane because she was a year older than me. I know she knew that I was in love and everything, but we didn't talk about me being gay necessarily. I didn't even know how to describe it, honestly. I didn't know what was going on. I just knew I was in love. So I think it was like the next year, I think we were at like a Wendy's or something eating some food before we played or something. And I just remember talking about it to her and she wasn't yet aware that she was gay. She was very much in her own world. Even though we played together, that separation of being at different schools at that time was almost like this chasm between us, you know, where she had her world going on and I had mine, but we got together and played. It was tender, you know, like I think I was going through so much and she was kind of wondering like, what was I going through? <laughs> because I was kind of getting more radical and, you know, I had some problems with depression and I was a cutter sometimes and just kind of going through this real struggle with my body and my sexuality and everything. And finally, I just told her, I really laid it out and she wasn't gay yet or didn't know it and was still dating guys. And it wasn't like, oh, great, you're gay. So am I, you know, anything like that. So even though she didn't even know she was gay at that point, did you have your own suspicions about Emily? It's funny because things were a little freer than that. During the time that I had a girlfriend, at one point, we were sort of separated and not together anymore. And I had a boyfriend for a while. And I really was in love. But I told him that he wanted to marry me. And I said, I can't. I'm gay. <laughs> like, I can't marry you. Like, I love you. And and I'm attracted to you. But I think that this is not our destiny. Like, I'm really gay, you know? And just, like, there's not an ounce of bisexuality in me, you know? <laughs> so it was more free, I think, because we were in college. And I don't think it was important to completely define yet, like, exactly who we were. I love hearing you say that because I think that we can discuss sexuality in like black and white terms so often, you know, 100% this or 100% that. So I love hearing that Amy Ray of the Indigo Girls was like in love with a man while also knowing she was gay. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I was confused by it because I really was so taken by him. But I think like in later years, I might have been able to not have to say to myself, no, I'm gay. I can't go down that path. Because I think in later years, I really felt like you really can go down whatever path you want, you know, it, like people defy sexuality and gender often and, and change in a, in a heartbeat, you know, and discover something different about themselves. And I think, you know, in my 30s or 40s, I might have been more like, yeah, I'm gay, but like, let's hang out and sleep together and have fun. You know what I mean? I would have been a little more like, it doesn't have to be so strict. When I met the Butchies, some of them had been in Team Dress and, and they formed this band, the Butchies in Durham. You know, I didn't have a good analysis of gender queer type stuff. Like, I didn't know what my gender dysphoria meant. I didn't know. I had, I mean, I was older and I had not even talked about it. They were in a different generation and I was like, oh my God, I feel so free now to be able to articulate this. 
When you say dealing with gender dysphoria and then being able to articulate it, articulate what specifically? I felt so not at home in my body and I struggled so much when I was really young of like wanting to be a boy. And when I got to a certain point, I just honored the female part of me too. I started understanding that this thing that I have in me is not unique and that so many people feel at odds with their body. And it made me have, you know, company around that and not feel so lonely. And and I made a decision that like I felt equal parts enough to just stay who I am. But I was very drawn to the idea that like there is this male in me that is so so at odds with this female body. And now I understand that other people feel the same way and that it's gender dysphoria and that there's people that are trans and they go through, they decide to transition and there's people that don't and there's all these options. When I heard about transgender, I didn't know that there was such a fluidity, you know, and so many options within that that you didn't have to be like, I'm going to be this or I'm going to be that. And it was very liberating for me because I was like, you know, it's okay for me to feel at odds with my body, but not necessarily feel so at odds that I need to transition and live in a different body and live as a man, you know. I can live as a lady man, you know, (laughs) or whatever, you know. It's like I can live this life however I want to live it. And I think I had met so many people in different places in their life around that that it made me just realize like there's not one right way to do this. And the one thing that I do know is that you honor everyone's way of doing it. So do you ID as trans or genderqueer or anything like that? I ID often as genderqueer. I don't ID as trans. My pronoun is she. I think because I've lived for so long in my life and struggled to be at peace with she, (laughs) you know, that I'm just, that that's what I embrace. But I definitely call myself genderqueer, and I definitely relate to people more that are fluid, and I feel so at home when I'm with people that understand that, you know, and it, it's it's nice. You know, before when I was like a kid, and I went through a lot of time when like when I was really young when people would call me a guy and I would think it was cool, and then when I was a teenager, it was embarrassing to be called the wrong thing, and I would be in a bathroom, and I would be looked at oddly, and even into adulthood, you know, when I was at the Home Depot checking out, and a woman would say, thank you, sir, and I would be like, you know, I'm ma'am, or something like that, and I'm like, why am I saying that? Like, it doesn't matter to me. I'm saying it because I'm trying to take care of them, because I realize that they're embarrassed when they realize that they don't know who I am, and that they need to have a sex to define in order to say talk to me, and it's just an awkward moment, and it's taken me all these years to just be like, okay with whatever anybody says, you know, and I'm always wanting to take care of people and make sure they don't feel bad, you know, because I'm I'm probably because I'm a Southerner. Well, I mean, I always wondered in the early years of like the Indigo Girls, sexuality aside, you were presenting as like this butch woman, you know, in public. And that was, I think, pretty rare for that time. Like, did you feel like people didn't know how to process like your like gender performance back then? <laughs> yeah, that's an understatement. I mean, I mean, I think our audience, I think our audience knew how to process it because they were, you know, right there with us. But like the business end of things was a mess. You know, it was like radio people did not know what to do, especially with me, because it's like, how do I relate to this girl who's really kind of a boy? They couldn't use the same old flirtation and lines with me because I was just kind of like a brick wall. And then I think on an industry side, as far as the label went, I think they didn't understand how to how to market us necessarily. They were like, should we dress them a certain way? Should we, like, what do we do with these, with these ladies, you know? Sometimes I had to be very like, you know, to the makeup person, like, just pretend I'm a guy and you're putting makeup on a guy. Like, I don't want to be, look like a real estate agent. Not anything against real estate agents, but when I get made up, like in a female way, I look like I work at, a, at an off. I don't look like a musician. I look like, you know, something different from what I am. They, they very quickly understood that like our audience was just who they are. And they're going to be supportive of us if we're just honest and genuine, you know. But we got a lot of crap from press people. And I mean, we got insulted constantly, you know, for like our appearance, what our audience looked like, for being butch, you know, for being lesbians with guitars and how mediocre it was and You know, a lot of it, I think, had to do with sexism and not understanding how to deal with masculine women. And I think a lot of it had to do with homophobia, like some kind of weird ism against like lesbians playing guitar. (laughs) It's like a lot of stuff that was just like anything but the music, you know, anything they could talk about except the music. 
Something that I find so interesting about, I think, just your relationship and dynamic is that we as a society know how to talk about and celebrate romantic love. But when it comes to Emily, like someone you've known literally your entire life and have been making music for 35 years with her, that's astonishing. But I don't think we honor those partnerships like we do romantic ones. Yeah, I mean, it is, it's a primary relationship, you know, for sure. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's, I've thought about that sometimes with other friendships I have that are so intense and they're around music, you know, and they're not romantic at all. They're musically romantic, I guess, but they're art. And it is hard to figure out where to put those because they do sort of dominate your life, <laughs> you know, and you prioritize them often over your own, over your your romantic relationship, you know, because I've been with the same person for 18 years now and often I've had to prioritize, well, a lot. I've had to prioritize Emily over everything, but I've always had models for that because like bands that I knew coming up were very closely knit you know, like families. Like I've always considered Emily like a sister, you know. I call it a sibling relationship more than anything, you know, but I can't, but I do understand what you mean because someone would be like, assume because you have that kind of a intense relationship with someone that it is sexual. Like people always thought Emily and I were together and I'm like, no, no, that never would have occurred to me <laughs> ever. Well, I think that I wondered too, like with all the speculation that you guys are secretly lovers, I I wondered if like in the back of your mind, (laughs) you're hearing that and wondering like, okay, but are they seeing something that I'm not seeing? And like, actually, are we in love? (laughs) Yeah. It's like, am I repressing for this many years a physical attraction? Yeah, no. Because like, we're not each other's types. It's like, it would be weird. It all and and I mean I always felt that way. I definitely felt intensely in love with her in an artistic and musical way, and like high school crush, a year older than me, writing songs already. Like I was just enamored by her abilities, you know. But it was more like a looking up to somebody, putting someone on a pedestal type of thing. Well, I think like how you describe that about her, I think like what I find so astonishing to use that word again, is that now, you know, 35 plus years later, you're still being able to like impress each other with your like music songwriting and like music abilities. Yeah, we still support each other. When she writes new, a new batch of songs, I talk about how great this one is or that one or point out things that I love. And or if she does a great vocal, I tell her, I mean, one thing that we do is we egg each other on and support each other. You know, we still do that. So you have to, you cannot be in a partnership this long and not be supportive. You know, it would feel terrible. I mean, are you able to articulate like why you've been able to achieve this longevity? I can articulate it in the practical way of how to keep a partnership together for a long time, which is, which I, cause I think some of it is a bit of a mystery, you know? And I think some of it is just our faith in the process of how we do things and that the sum is greater than the parts, you know, kind of thing. And I think we know that. So first of all, we respect that. It's an entity unto itself. And second of all, we give each other a ton of space. And so that's like a lesson right there. A ton. Like we write separately. We have solo careers separately. We have our own friendships with other people. We don't hang out with the same groups. We live in separate towns. We're very opposite each other. We honor the difference, you know, and that's the secret probably. Well, with that thing that you have together when you are making music, that that, that magic, let's call it, was it there from day one or did you have to like work and find that? I feel like it was there from day one. I don't know what she would say. When I heard us singing together in my head, like when we first were in my parents' basement learning like a cover song, you know, I was just, my head felt like it was going to explode because I was like, this is amazing. Like not, we sound amazing, but this feels amazing. You know, it was always about this feels amazing. It wasn't like, we're going to be famous. It was like, this is the most fun I've ever had. So I want to keep doing this. That's how I felt. Wait, what was the song? It was Junkies Lament by James Taylor. I think that's the first song we learned. We had a lot of covers. We would go to the high school and sit in my English teacher's classroom and play after school and people would come and sit around with us and listen. It's very high school. 
Well, with Closer to Find specifically, which is arguably your most famous song, the Indigo Girls have done so many songs. You know, looking across your entire catalog, 35 years later, does it surprise you that it's Closer to Find that has been like the one still? It does not surprise me. Because <laughs> that song, you know, Emily knows how to write a song that resonates with people in this way that I can't do, but she is some, I don't know what it is, it's some crazy quality she has to just put her finger right on the pulse. I can even look at it from the outside and be like, it's a classic song. It's written in a certain way. It's got this chorus. Every You know, a lot of people can relate to it at different stages of their life. It's just took on a life of its own and as a sing-along, so it's kind of unstoppable. Well, I think that you, the two of you have like never shied away from like writing about serious things too. That's true. And I think it's like that combo in the lyrics, not harmonies. <laughs> One example is Ghost. And, you know, hidden in this song, it's I'm in love with your ghost. And then the lyric, there's not enough room in this world for my pain. You know, like when I thought about it, I was like, that's a really a serious lyric. <laughs> yeah, Emily wrote that too. That's my that's one of my favorite songs that she's written, actually, because that melody is so sweeping and like she's she can write a melody. It's almost so epic to me that I never take the words apart and look at a sentence on its own. You know, I just think of it as this force that's so married to the music. It just is so evocative, you know, you could not, for me, like, if I just heard the melody, it's so evocative on its own, even, you know, it's always been one of my favorite songs so, of Emily's, for sure. I mean, it stand, stands the test of time and probably one of the ones that's the most requested, too. But that is a very serious lyric, you know, it's a, it's a statement, for sure. I mean, when you first heard that lyric come out of her mouth, do you stop in the studio and like process that together <laughs> no. or do you just like, continue on? No, we're not allowed to process each other's lyrics together. I mean, it's an unspoken rule. <laughs> I mean, every now and then I'll be like, what did you mean by that? Or what are you writing about? But she doesn't really say. She won't. She holds her cards pretty close. But I've heard her say something that she thought one of my songs was about and be totally wrong before. And, I'm, and I've done the same thing to her songs. So I know that we, we don't know. It's great because we still can have these like our own inner life that the other person never figures out, you know, which is nice because it gives you that space. But we, you know, we'll process lyrics if one of us thinks that someone needs to like define something better or polish it up or if it's clumsy sounding and it's just oh but only if the other person asks like i'll say like i wrote this line i'm having trouble with it can you help me figure out like what's wrong with it that's the only way we do it if the other person asks. do you have an example oh god sometimes it'll be like she has an extra verse that doesn't really need to be there and she'll say do you think this verse needs to be there and i'm like ah eh, you know it's good but you could probably use it somewhere else like in another song save it oh i know what it was it was in a song called shit kicking there was a lyric in it where I'm talking about my granddad. He was a minister, but when he was in college, he talks about in a journal that I read about going to a party that was hosted by the Klan in the community because the Klan would host these parties and invite everyone to go. And it was building up community support, like the Klan trying to whitewash what they were doing by having these big parties where they would feed people for free. It was terrible, like insidious. And I was like, oh my God, like my granddad <laughs> went to one of these parties. Like it's sort of like a shocker, right? And so I had a line in there about that, like went to the party hosted by the Ku Klux Klan or something. And I said to Emily, I said, you know, this seems to me to take away from the song because it's so specific and it's going to be the only thing that somebody remembers. And it's not the point. The point of the song is your legacy kind of growing around you like kudzu and, and you've got to get out of the weeds and figure out where you stand and understand that there's skeletons in your closet. And I asked Emily, you know, I was like, I think I should leave, you know, and we talked about it for a while and she helped me decide to change the line and it was really better for it. She's a great songwriter and she teaches people how to write songs. And so I can ask her questions and she can be a teacher. I also don't want this entire conversation to make it sound like Emily is the good songwriter <laughs> and, and Amy is not. That's okay. She does write all the... She writes all the classic songs. That's not true. I'm going to push back there because I think Land of Canaan, oh. I believe you wrote. <laughs> yeah, I did. But it's it's classic, but it's not like this well-crafted, technically like accomplishment song. It's like a passionate song with two chords, which is fine. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I think I love it because I also love when you perform it. I can just tell that like you are working so hard. <laughs> That's what I want to see on stage. Yeah, yeah, you know? working hard on that one for sure. <laughs> 
it's true. That one's so old. It's got a certain sentiment that's just takes on a life of its own, you know, in a way. Has your own relationship to it changed? No, not really. I can, when I sing that, I can still feel the feelings I felt when I wrote it and be in it. And it doesn't feel, it's a very young song in a lot of ways. In it's writing, it's young, you know, and I've learned a lot about writing since then. But I don't, I don't shy away from singing it because of that. For that song in particular, I can still feel passionate about the feelings I was having at the time, you know, and not, I, I don't look at it and be like, oh my God, I was so overwrought. I look at it and I think to myself, wow, I was in a real <laughs> bind in that moment in my life, you know, and I can, and it's good. I can remember that. With these early songs that we're talking about, the early albums you put out when you were not publicly out, did that affect your songs where you were changing them to make them not so overtly gay? Not me. No, I didn't. In fact, I relished the protection of a song to be who I was. You know, like I felt like a song was like a shield. I had spent so many years singing cover songs and not changing. I never change pronouns when I sing a cover song. When I was a kid, I didn't even do it. Like I didn't change to sing about a guy instead of to sing about a girl. I just embodied the person that wrote it. There was a song by James Taylor called Mill Worker. He sang it as a woman that worked in a mill. And I was young when I heard that. And I was like, huh, I like that. That's cool. Like when I sing Romeo and Juliet, when I first learned that song, Mark Knopfler wrote it. I sang it as a man singing. And I could really go there. And it was before on the outside would even talk about gender fluidity or anything like that. Yeah, I didn't really change my writing ever. Like when you look at those songs, you don't even have to have pronouns to know how gay they are. You know, it's like <laughs> this perspective of writing when we were young is very much outsider and loneliness and disenfranchisement and questioning ourselves and all the things that you feel when you're struggling as a kid who's gay. It's in there. Well, I think that when you were starting out making music too, we didn't have the ability just to Google like, hey, Google, are the Indigo Girls gay? We couldn't do that. So I think like everyone was listening to your, to your music and saying like, yeah, they're gay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> gaydar. <laughs> it's 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 real. <laughs> because like while you were not publicly out early on, you also are not doing interviews and talking about like boyfriends that didn't exist. True, true. Was that something that you and Emily were always on the same page about? no. We weren't. Emily didn't want to talk about being gay. It was just an agreement we had. She wasn't ready. She had good reason of her own for it. And, you know, we always also felt like people need to take their time. You know, I felt like you're not ready. It's okay. And she would say, well, you can do an interview and talk about your own life, but I'm not going to. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to do an indigo girl thing and talk about that if you're not ready. And then at some, I think it was like 91 or 92. I can't remember. We were doing some kind of a college radio, like press conference type thing and up in Western mass. And she answered a question and kind of came out when she answered it. And I was like, Oh, that just happened. I talked to her afterwards. I remember we were walking across the quad. I was like, what just happened there? <laughs> you know, just like, what did you just do? And I was so happy about it. Cause I was like, okay, great. Because my perspective was, it's not like people don't know. And it's not like our families don't know and our friends don't know and even our grandparents know. And I get that we don't want to be pigeonholed as this lesbian folk duo, but we already are. Either way, you're crucified. Like, let's just like be out. And we're asking everyone in the audience to like be individuals and believe in themselves. And we're talking about like believing in yourself and how important it is and, and how everybody counts. But we're not willing to be who we are. And it doesn't make sense to me. And then she came around and it was all, it didn't take long and that was it. That's such an important distinction that it wasn't that you were consciously deciding we are not going to air our sexuality in public, that you were just like still on the road of figuring it out and like getting there. Yeah. Am I articulating that correct? Yes, you're, it's, you're, it's exactly what was happening. Huh. I mean, we were immersed in our own struggles around it and pressured by our mentors to be more open but resistant to that because we were so afraid of of ourselves and of how fragile an audience can be and we didn't want anyone to feel alienated and at the time being very outspokenly gay did alienate people because everything was so 
conservative and backwards, you know? And so we were just suffering under fear. It was fear. I mean, it was just fear. And I kind of was like, I'm scared too, but like, we can't go out there and ask. It's like an agreement with our audience. You know, we're asking everybody to be themselves and we got to do the same thing. Was there a camaraderie between you and other women like Melissa Etheridge and Katie Lang? Not really. Really? Now, KD, you know, we only met her a couple times. She keeps to herself, you know, a bit. She's private. I think like in my fantasy, you're sneaking off to like the bar or like the cubbyhole together. <laughs> right. I mean, Melissa, when, when we first started playing and we went to L.A. to play, like when we first started, when we got signed and we were out in L.A. making records and playing out there, we did a couple shows together and tried to be comrades. But she was in a different place. You know, it was very the difference between kind of California and Georgia. She was in a celebrity scene that was very much around like compromise and sort of towing the label line and all that. And we were like the South kind of independent DIY scene. Like you never compromise, you know, you do it, you be yourself. If you don't want to do something, you don't do it. If you don't want to change a song, you don't change it. I mean, sometimes to our detriment, because sometimes people are right when they give you advice, you know? So she was much more on a different path and each thing is fine. They're both worthy. But the thing was, we just didn't hang in the same arenas. You know, before I let you go, next week, I'm interviewing Brandy Carlisle. Oh, my God. Yes. You know, one of my favorite people in all time. Yes. And Brandy is. I mean, how does it feel to have, like, inspired, like, such a force as Brandy Carlisle? I mean, the inspiration went two ways. You know, when we met her, I was blown away by her presence and her performance and her voice and her spirit and her writing and everything. I was immediately blown away. So it, I've never felt like... Yeah, yeah, we gave her hand up or something like that. When Brandy started opening for us, Emily and I would sit by the side of the stage and we'd be like, well, I give it about two years and we'll be opening for her. It was really like so obvious that she was so ascend. I mean, it was so obvious that, that she was ascending. Like lately, somebody would be like, why don't you get Brandy to sing on that song? And I'll be like, no way. I know how busy she is. I'm not going to ask her to do anything, <laughs> you know, because she's just crazy busy. Yeah, I'm glad you're interviewing her. She's very important to this to this community. And so are you. You've been so generous today with your time. So thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, no, I'm happy to be part of it. Jeez. We still need this. We still need this. You know, we need this. And that is the incredible Amy Ray. She's got a new song out called Muscadine, if you want to give that a listen. And as you heard, yes, next week, Brandy Carlisle will be here. So if you've not yet subscribed, please do that now. And while you're doing that, if I can ask for a favor please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Doing things like that really do make a huge difference in getting more eyeballs or earballs in this case on the show, and it is very much appreciated. We're brought to you by The Advocate Magazine in partnership with GLAAD. I'm Jeffrey Masters, and I'll see you next week.